your Bibles, please. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We are, after taking quite a hiatus, I did not plan it that way, it just worked out that way, we are now starting once again war on the saints. This is serious for those of you that have not been here. I believe with all my heart we're going to see warfare, spiritual, like we haven't seen it before. I want to read something a little bit before we get into, uh, before we get into this there in Ephesians 6. Now, I, how, many, how many Air Force guys we have here? Raise your hand. Air Force. Okay, all right. There's a couple of us. All right, excellent. Uh, I, I, I remember when there was quite a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ at the Air Force Academy. By the way, that's okay. I'll tell you what else it is. It's constitutional. But we have people like a fellow by the name of Mikey Weinstein. I'm not making fun of his name. That's what he calls himself. And by the way, I pray that this gentleman come to know the Lord. I was going to have Wayne put a picture of him up. This guy, I believe he, he specializes in trying to look mean and nasty. Official photos. But listen, listen to what happened just recently. We're, we're just talking several days ago. An Air Force general who recently spoke about how God has guided his career should be court-martialed, a civil liberties group is saying. In a speech at a National Day of Prayer task force event on May 7th, Major General Craig Olson credits God for his accomplishments in the military and refers to himself as a, quote, redeemed believer in Christ, unquote. I'd say that's pretty good, amen? Amen. That's good stuff, Maynard. The Air Force Times reported that the, and and I love the, the title they gave this, the Military Religious Freedom Foundation. They should call it the Religious Freedom, or Religious, from Religious Freedom, anyway, has taken issue with Olson's remarks, is calling, they're, they're calling for, the two-star general to be court-martialed, and this is a quote, this is a quote, aggressively and very visibly brought to justice for his unforgivable crimes and transgressions, unquote. That's what they called it. The letter posted on the group's website begins, and this is now a quote, This demand letter is sent to you on behalf of countless members of the United States Air Force who are utterly disgusted and shocked by the brazenly illicit and wholly unconstitutional fundamentalist Christian proselytizing recently perpetrated on international television. It was on God TV and streaming all over the internet and in full military uniform by USAF Major General Craig S. Olson on Thursday, May 7th, 2015, during a very, all in capitals, public speech for a private Christian organization, the National Day of Prayer Task Force. Now, I've got a picture of, of President Washington when he was a general, on his knees in prayer. It was known that he prayed. Headed up by Focus on the Family founder, Dr. James Dobson, and his wife, Shirley Dobson. This group believes, this is taken from them, this group believes that the American flag and the U.S. Constitution are the only religious symbol and scripture, respectively, for those who serve in the military. Also wants other service members, other service members, who helped Olson to be investigated and punished, quote, to the full extent of extent of military law, unquote. What was it that this man said? Well, during his 23-minute remarks, 23 minutes remar- remarks, he said this. He spoke of, quote, flying complex aircraft doing complex nuclear missions, I have no ability to do that. God enabled me to do that, unquote. Well, I praise God. 
you know, he said that. He says he put me in charge of failing programs worth billions of dollars. This is Olson speaking. I have no ability to do that, no training to do that. God did that. He sent me to Iraq to negotiate foreign military sales, sales deals through an Arabic interpreter. I have no ability to do that. I was not trained to do that. God did all of that. And Mikey Weinstein blew a proverbial gasket. That is hatred. That is absolute hatred, folks. Now, now look, you know, and, and there's people watching this live going over, go over or they'll, they'll hear these remarks. I don't have a problem with that. This, this, is, this is war. This is the absolute war. Now, again, like we have talked about before, there's no greater love than the message that we have for these people. Jesus Christ died for them. It's amazing. Jesus Christ died for Mikey Weinstein. And he hates him. He hates God. This is not about separation of church and state. This is about separation of God and state. And they don't, they don't want him. So look, we want to be able to war a good warfare. The scripture tells us that. We want to, be, we, we want to preach the truth in love. And it's going to get harder. They'll come to us eventually. This is eventually going to happen. They'll come to us and say, unless you change your message, just like Hillary Clinton said. She said, religions, and I forget what other group, they need to change what they believe. I'm sorry, this doesn't change. It does not change. We're not trying to hate someone. We're trying to tell them it was God that created marriage. It was God that created the world, period. You see how long Satan has been busy, you know, weaving in his lies? No wonder that after the situation when the rapture takes place and everything starts coming apart in the world, they're going to believe a lie. The world is, that's what the world's going to happen. No matter what happens, the world is going to believe a lie. But right now, before we get to what, you know, we like to call the sweet by and by, we've got the nasty now and now. So I want to give you three things. Before we get into the detail, we, we, we need to see something here tonight. We need to be all on, all because, and all in. All on, all because, and all in. I want you to go to, if you would please, Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> We're not going to be heading back into uh, um, territory that we have been on already. We have gone through some of the pre- uh, the, the, the talking about getting, before we get into the, um, uh, the armor. And just before we do that, we're going to be looking at one verse. That is verse 13. Wherefore, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We need to be all on, all because, and all in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in these moments that you would help us to see what it is that you're seeking to teach us. I pray, God, <coughs> that we would take so very seriously the place and the time that you have put us. We are in the greatest nation on earth. We're in the Sacramento area. We have an opportunity to do so much for you, but we want to do it your will your way, your power, and we're going to need all that you give us, all that you are. So help us now, I ask, in Christ's name, amen. Wherefore, on this account, because the fight is with such powers as the demons of Satan, we need to be, number one, all on Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, he's already said that in verse 11. Look at the beginning of verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So we are indeed reiterating some things that we've studied before. But again, we haven't been there for a while, so I thought, you know what? 
We've got to get back to this. Take unto you means to take up once and for all. Take up for one's self. It'd be great if we could help you know, if we could help put other people's armor on and make sure they use it properly. And by the way, we can encourage each other with that. But first and foremost, we've got to make sure that we do it. We need to understand this. It doesn't say, make for yourselves armor. You know, did you hear about the, 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 the Polish army that they didn't have a whole lot and so they decided they needed to practice how to be in war? Anybody remember Polish jokes? So, so what, what you do, and, and, and so it says, all right, those of you that want to be riflemen, you walk around and you go banga, banga, banga. And those of you that, you know, you want to have fixed bayonets with yours, you walk around going stabba, stabba, stabba. Okay, everybody, get ready. So they're going around, banga, 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 stabba, stabba, stabba. And this one guy, he's just walking around like this. And he's pushing people over. And they said, what are you doing? He goes, tanka, tanka, tanka. <laughs> he wants a tank. Now, now, now look, I, you know, when it comes to fighting, maybe that would be kind of a good thing to be in because, you know, when you've got a tank, you've got armor that's this thick. You know, I mean, just, just great. We would love to think, okay, you know, I, 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 I need to kind of figure out some things what I could do. God's got it figured out. He knows exactly what you need and I need to fight in the spiritual warfare. Don't try to tell God he doesn't do, he doesn't know what he's doing. Our biggest challenge is what happened to the Roman army. Because after time, when there were no more battles to fight, and, and, and uh, discipline got a little lax, what wound up happening? The Roman soldiers got to complaining about the weight of their armor, and they started leaving pieces of the armor behind. And in doing so, they got out of shape. Now, I remember when I was in the reserve over here at Travis, we didn't have a war to fight at that time. And so it's like we were coming in once a month and we're doing pretend warfare. Well, when you work on the flight line and you're working with, with these behemoths that, that we had over there, it's kind of hard to, you know, just, just kind of pretend, go through the, go through the motions and, and, and such. Uh, we had little things that we did, you know, to... Uh, to amuse ourselves when we were up flying. Remember when, you know, uh, CB radios were, were in, you know, everybody was wanting to get a CB radio, and they had like 1.4 watts, these things, you know, so, so, you know, truckers are going down the road and people, they're putting them in their cars. The CB radio that we had and the C5 Galaxy had 7,000 watts. So we had visions of getting on with these guys and clicking and just making their antennas just melt. You know, those are kind of things you do when you don't really have a battle to go on. It got kind of, it, it, it got kind of sloppy a little bit. And actually, honestly, guys really started getting discouraged because there was a downturn in the attitude towards the military in America. This was the late 1970s. I think that's all I need to say there. I got out of the reserves in October of 79. In 1980, there was an election. I don't think I need to say any more about that. I took my youth group a couple of years later to a, a, an air show over at Travis, and I ran into the old guys that I knew back there. I said, man, how's everything going? They said, it's going great. They were at 102% of, you know, of uh, personnel. I mean, everybody was right on. I mean, when they, when they did the monthly stuff now, it was fantastic. The attitude was just there. They were ready to battle. A few years before, pfft, ain't gonna happen. I mean, not, you know, not like it really could. There's an attitude that we need to understand that we can have for this warfare. 
In that attitude, we need to understand this. We don't make up ourselves what we need. But also take note of this. God is not a God of waste. If he made it, if he formed it, if he offers it, and I'm talking about the armor of God, if he makes it, makes it, if he offers it, if he formed it, it's because you and I need it. You look down the list, having your loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. We need these things. God is not a God of waste. When, uh, when I was in elementary school back in the 60s, uh, I went to a public high school, a public school, excuse me, elementary school. I went to a public school, Nevada Avenue School there in Canoga Park. And we started learning some things about evolution. One of those things about evolution was vestigial organs. How many of you remember that? You were taught that. Anybody? Okay, what's a vestigial organ? They said, here's an organ in the body that as we have evolved, you don't need that anymore. And guess what medicine has been finding out ever since then? You need that. Now, I've got a couple of organs that are missing now. I, I don't have, what is it that I don't have right here? Not a heart. <laughs> huh? No, I, I don't have a gallbladder and I'm missing a right kidney. So I lean to the left and, you know, I'm just, you know, I got zippers here, you know, just all over, you know, stuff. But, you know, I can tell that I'm missing a couple of things. All right? Now, don't start talking about this up here. It's fine and well and doing good for the most part. For the most, for the most part. But, but, but the point is, when it, when, it comes to, when, when it comes to this, when it comes to this, we can't come to God and say, you know what, Th there's some stuff here that we just don't need. No, we need it all. We need that shield of faith, all and on. So this is one thing that we've got to understand. We need to be, we need to have all on. Secondly, all because, look at the verse, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. You need all of it because this is what you do. What does it mean, the evil day? Well, it refers to today. This is an evil day. It refers to any day when there's an onslaught of temptations. If wickedness is abounding, it's the evil day. When there's, some, when there's a time that comes along where Satan is doing his worst on you, that's the evil day. When you're tempted, it's the evil day. When the world is wooing you, that's the evil day. What do you want to do? You want to withstand when there's unusual temptation. And you know, listen, I, I think sometimes if we were honest with ourselves, we'd almost be embarrassed to hear, to, if we were to have other people hear about when we get tempted with something and why we're tempted. Listen, guys, when those thoughts come along that ought not to be in us, they're called junk thoughts. They're called thoughts of the flesh. Just toss them aside. Thank God for the victory that you have and move on. But this is why we need this. There is an evil day. You go home, if you turn your television on, all of a sudden there's something that you don't want to see. You don't need to see. It's the same thing with the internet. Fellas, we've got to be careful. By the way, ladies, you do too. You know, even with the young people. Did you hear? I just, I, I just saw this. A high school class, a high school class, now I know nothing about this movie except this. It's class A, number one, wicked. But a high school class in a government school was rewarded. They got their test done. Everybody passed. The teacher showed them 50 shades of gray. Government school. Government school. There's some other illustrations I talk about, but we've got young ears in here. But it's going on in our schools. In our schools. Now that's sad. That's the evil day, people. That's the evil day. We have got to be able to stand. The word withstand means to stand against, to resist, to oppose. 
This is what we do. Like Martin Luther, who stood at the Diet of Worms, he was accused of heresy. What was his heresy? He believed that mankind was saved by faith alone in Christ. Boy, that's about as unbiblical as you can get, right? Oh, my soul. What did he say? He said, my conscience is, conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand and cannot do otherwise. We can't stand, we cannot withstand unless we've done our duty. Unless we have obeyed and prepared ourselves, and that means putting on all the armor of God. All on. All because. You may be able to withstand in the evil day. Paul told the people in Rome, in Romans 13, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. 2 Corinthians 10, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Fight the good fight of faith, he told Timothy. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So all on, put on the whole armor of God, all because there's an evil day. Lastly, and be all in, and having done all to stand. The least we can do is stand. The best we can do, stand, like Martin Luther talked about. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 24, if you would. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Um, we, we had a, when I started going to Christian school, in, um, in seventh grade, the school was not very big. Now they run about 12, 1,300 students, K through 12. But when I was there, I mean, like, in, in my graduating class, we had it was either 11 or 13. It wasn't a big school. So here was the rule. If you went out for football, you went out for basketball. If you went out for basketball, you went out for baseball. If you went out for baseball, you also ran on the track team. That's just the way it is. Now, you know, I was never really all that good at track. Anybody here, you really enjoyed track? Okay, good. Hey, praise God. That's great. Excellent. I didn't do that. But I wound up, you know, in the 440, the 880 and all that. And I thought, you know, okay, um, I'll go ahead. I, I think it was the 440 I was running at this time. Now they just got it all in meters and stuff. So I started running. You know, I'm in this race and I'm going to run. Okay. Did I train? Not a lick, not a chance. At first I thought, I'm doing pretty good. And then, Brother McGregor, I needed a nurse. <laughs> all of a sudden, it starts going dark. And next thing I know, all I've got is tunnel vision. And before I can get to the finish line, I finished. <laughs> Off over to the side. You know, it's amazing what the body can do when it's reached its limit. It's amazing what it makes you do when it reached its limit. It was over with in more ways than one. You know, I wasn't running so that I could obtain. I wasn't prepared. And so what happened? I didn't finish. See, there is one thing, though, that we can do. We can get this book and we can learn to finish. We can understand that we've got a battle, we've got a race. Let's continue with that. Verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's disciplined. He's disciplined. Now, now look, people can, can, they, they can go back and forth and argue or whatever. Uh, when should you read your Bible? First and foremost, you need to read your Bible. Okay, I, I, I'm telling you right now, you will fail as a believer in Christ if you are not reading your Bible. Not only if you're, this is what you've got to do. Not only do you need to go through the Word of God, you need to let the Word of God go through you. I, and, and prayerfully, 
prayerfully. Now, praise God, when we're believers, the Holy Spirit is with us. He's there. There is nothing more exciting and invigorating than when you're reading the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is there and all of a sudden He speaks to you and you see a verse that you have read a hundred times before and it's like it's all new. And it's like, yes, man, that's great. There's nothing like it. Do it. Absolutely do it. Get tempered in this thing. Go back to verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible, just like Christ. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I'll, I'll, never, I'll, I'll never forget. Norm, one time I was about right where you're at. This was before we had these chairs. And I was just getting ready to preach. And somebody walked up to me and told me about a pastor that had just fallen in this area. And it just hurt. You know, you don't like hearing that. By the way, if you ever hear about a pastor that falls, don't glory in that. Don't, don't get proud. You know, Satan takes that and he loves it. He absolutely runs with it and the world will gloat over it. They'll glory in it. And all it does is it besmirches the name of Christ. Yeah, but he's not part of our crowd. If he names the name of Christ, Satan's going to use it. The world's going to love it. And we don't want to see a pastor go down like that. We don't want to see a believer go down. We do not want that. Yeah, but they gave me a hard time. Pray for them. You know, it's amazing. You can't hate people that you pray for. You know that? You can't. We're in this, like we've talked about already. You see the people that give you a hard time, they're not your enemy. We've got one enemy. And praise God, he is doomed. People who have a soul, we can pray for them. We can pray for them. Yeah, but, you know, they did this and that. I know, I hear you. How many of you, you've ever had somebody, abs- I mean, they, they've done you dirt, raise your hand. Okay, isn't it great you can pray for those people? Yeah, I pray, you know, the imprecatory prayers out of Psalms, Lord, smack them hip and thigh, may their belly rot, their guts fall out, you know. No, you know, no, you, you, know you don't do that. You don't do that. Christ taught us to pray differently, okay? He taught us to pray differently. I myself should be a castaway. That's that's the same thing here as someone who doesn't take seriously the armor of God. I want you to go, go, if you would, please, in closing. Go, if you would, to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Now, come on. I, I, let, let's, let's play a game called Drop Dead Honest. When you're reading the Old Testament, guys and even some girls, you love it when you start reading where the action is. David's doing his stuff. Elijah, he's calling fire down on the mount. I mean, sometimes it's when the blood flies and the guys are going and David and Goliath, I mean, when we were there in that valley where David and Goliath met, I would say, yeah, you can, you can see it. This is great. You love the action. When we read these stories, there are some names that come out, and you think, wow, this is, this is really something. 2 Samuel chapter 23 is a fascinating chapter because listed there are the mighty Men of David. Now, one of these stories I'm just going to go ahead and get to. It's great. Look at verse 13. And three of the 30 chief, this talks about the mighty men of David. Three of the chief went down and came to David in the harvest time 
unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in an hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. Where was David from? Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. I, I can just picture him. He's just going, he's looking, he's looking across the, the, the way there, and he's looking at Bethlehem, and he's, he remembers as a child where he got water, good, good cold water there. And he's musing kind of out loud. Three guys hear it, and they look at each other, and they go, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, I'm thinking what you're thinking. Think we can do it? I think we can. And here come three guys barreling through, you know, and the Philistines are going, whoa, they're charging. But there's just three of them. I think they're stunned. What are these idiot Jews going to do? And they come charging in, blades flying. I don't know, maybe guys are dying. It's just whatever. What are they going to try to get? Are they going after our, you know, are they going after our general, whatever? No, where did they stop? They stopped at the well. What are they doing? They're drawing water. I got a feeling, they're going, say what? They're getting water. And so here, guy brings up a Dixie cup. I don't know, he's got, you know, whatever it is. And so here, they're, they go flying back. You, look at this. Verse 16, And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines, drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, took it, and brought it to David. Here's a guy, glass in one hand, sword in the other. The other two are fighting with him. And they bring it to David. You thirsty? And what did he say? I, 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 I envision he's got tears coming down his eyes. He says, I can't do that. This is the blood of these men. And he poured it out as an offering. Now here's the thing. You read this chapter. Look at verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tecmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adono, the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. This guy was a man's man. I mean, th- I mean he, he just, I mean, he's, he's the Marines and the Navy SEALs and everything. He's all wrapped into one. Th- this guy, how many did he slew? Slay, slew, slew, slew. How many did he kill? 800. I'd say the guy probably needs to get a Medal of Honor, don't you think? Listen, look, look. Verse 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. Now, they didn't have the finesse that we've got when it comes to names. The Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle... And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave under the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. The guy couldn't pray, pry the thing out of his hand. It's frozen there. But look, look, look what happened. The Lord used him and the Lord wrought a great victory. And the people returned after him only to spoil. Come on, people. What they had, you got it. And, and Israel came, whoosh, why? Because one guy believed that God would help him. And after him was Shammah. I love this. I love this. The son of Agi, the, Her- the, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And once again, and the Lord wrought a great victory. The guy's fighting these Philistines. For what? Beans. A field of lentils. I don't know what the beans, whatever they are. Huh? Something like, yeah, something to the tune of. But he's defending this. You ain't going to get my beans. This belongs. Yeah, yeah, but it's just, I don't care what you think it is. You come and you just try to take it. This chapter is full of men like this, including, finally, Uriah the Hittite. These were the mighty men of David. They excelled. You know what's interesting? 
It's not so much the names that you find that are fascinating, but it's who you don't find. See, because when we read elsewhere and we really get into the, we really get into it, we read of Joab, you know, David's, yeah, his captain. I mean, this, this guy was awesome. He was great. He was a fighter. He was also a murderer. He paid with his life. Why? Because of his flesh. He was self centered. He loved the king, yes but he loved himself more. He failed. He failed. That's not good. There were also some others that are mentioned here, or not mentioned. Ahithophel, great general, great fighter, but he didn't love the king. There's also one more that people might say, well, it's kind of a stretch if you were going to put him there. I don't think so. Jonathan. Jonathan. See, Jonathan loved David. David said, we had a love together that was beyond the love of women. But Jonathan left David. He went back to the palace. He could have stayed with David. He could have. But for some reason, he did not. There are people in God's Word that they were there, and they were on, but they weren't all on. And they weren't all in. You might think that your place, that your situation isn't isn't that big of a deal. Who's going to notice if you're faithful? God is. God is. You see, no matter where you are, if you get all on, all because you understand what's going on, and you're all in, God's going to reward that. Your name might not be much. And you might see yourself as the son of of a dodo or whatever. But if you make the list, boy, he was faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's it. That's it. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us not to look around and think, well, we're not much, and therefore we can't do much, and I'm not much, and I don't have that much talent. Lord, that's not how you judge. You judge according to what a man hath, and not what he hath not. The Apostle Paul told us that as he spoke to the church at Corinth. Lord, whatever field you've given us, help us to defend it. Whatever enemy we have, as it were, help us to understand that we have the victory in you. But Lord, help us to be all on. Help us to take all the armor. Because we need it in the evil day. We need to be all in to stand. Pray that you'd bless. This week, use us, Lord, for your glory in a great way. Not for our glory, but for yours, according to your will. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed.